Uh, name and pronouns. <laughs> I, uh, I'll go by Seabass. I, um, just for the sake of uh, not getting recognized at the moment. And uh, you can call me he, him. Uh, all right. Uh, well, thank you for hopping on, Seabass. What do you got in your mind today? So I uh, emailed you a little while ago about um, your video reacting to Mearsheimer's Ukraine lecture from about uh, from 2014. Yes. I, uh, I think you were, at the very least, uncharitable and possibly wrong, if you can bear to hear such a thing. It's been known to happen. <laughs> not this so, time, though. But go no, ahead, try. I, um, I think your reaction to the video happened uh, right after all your drama with the actual tankies that legitimately supported uh, Russia. So I, I think your reaction seemed more harsh and less charitable than I typically see you do during de a debate. So my hope here is that I can uh, convince you that um, despite some of Mearsheimer's more uh, concerning language, the argument he lays out is pretty unegregious and agreeable. Um, sure, hit me up. I do think the um, language that he used was pretty biased yeah. by its nature. The way that stuff was framed was pretty weird. The, um, I don't know why he insists on using the word coup and used incorporation instead of annexation. It, uh, that part's beyond me. I, uh, I'm not gonna try to defend that. You, you can win that one. I'll concede right here. Uh, gotcha. But beyond that, what, what broader point do you think, uh, I failed to grasp? So, John Mearsheimer makes the argument there's certain uh, political, certain inevitabilities in international politics that uh, the actions one country takes uh, will result in other countries taking particular actions inevitably, regardless of whether those are good. Um, or maybe not, if not inevitably, with a pretty high degree of certainty. And so, during your video, you seem to take a lot of moral issue with Mearsheimer's argument. And uh, it doesn't strike me that Mearsheimer's argument is a moral one. It's uh, He's trying to figure out causation, and um, he blames Russia's inv incursion into Ukraine, uh, invasion, on the West's handling of Ukraine's uh, flirting with Western ship, if that makes sense. Uh-huh. So, um, oh, I don't want to go bit by bit. Uh, I took some notes on your video, but um, what's, uh, what's your position on Mearsheimer now? Just summed up very quickly. So, the issue that I have here is that in geopolitics and in sociology, there's a historical precedent for people who will enable really bad social policies by making, quote, non-moral arguments and instead deferring to some kind of historical inevitability that I disagree with. For example, this is the logic of a lot of ethnostaters. So when ethnostaters talk about the necessity for different races of people to have their own nations, they usually don't frame this in a moral sense. They frame this as an inevitable conclusion which must be derived from the fact that people of different racial groups, according to them, just don't get along that well, you know. They perceive it as an inevitability, a, a just a fact of the human condition, and therefore their advocacy for ethnostates isn't them being racist, it's not them having a moral take, it's just them acknowledging reality as it stands. That's the vibe that I got from Mearsheimer's lecture. The idea that, like, geopolitical hegemons must be given the, like, leeway to invade, conquer, destroy, brutalize, rape, pillage. Can I catch you you... This is, a, I guess, a separate issue from what you said at the beginning. Can I catch you off here? Is that okay? Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, do you think there are correct and incorrect assessments of inevitabilities? Uh, yeah, of course. Okay, so it's possible that uh, the racists, the ethnostaters, are wrong about uh, inevitable clashes between racial groups. What would it take for you to believe that Mearsheimer is right, that if not necessarily inevitable, it's highly likely that Russia would respond to Western um, attempts to woo Ukraine in this way? Well, there are levels of charitability we have to afford here because we have to remember that depending on how we use our definitions, and they are highly variable, um, ethnostaters can make a compelling argument if you refer only to historical inevitability. It's not like there aren't plenty of examples of massive racial antagonism when different ethnic or racial groups exist in the same place. Um, of course, there are counter-arguments to this. You can look at that and go, okay, well, there are alleviated circumstances here, but it's still something that an argument can be made for, however incorrect I might find it. In the case of Mearsheimer and this geopolitical, you know, um, you know, uh, it, it, the the right to control these neighboring areas stuff. I, I, I just think it's, I just think it's dumb 
Estonia, Latvia, okay. and Lithuania have been freed from direct threats of Russian geopolitical control because of NATO. It seems like it's possible for us to circumvent this this inevitability of of, of hegemon by forming, you know, political, military, and trade alliances that override that, you know, like, it's it's not like America has free reign to brutalize Mexico and Canada because we're their neighbors, right? Canada is an ally okay. of ours, but even if they weren't, like, there are broader like consequences. Inevitabilities and moral statements. You said that uh, we don't have free reign. I, I think you mean that morally because, in a purely physical sense, we, we kind of do. No, the we don't. U.S. The, the Monroe Doctrine. We, the, wor the world would not respond well to that behavior from us but we have the capacity and un under we have the, the capacity to nuke the world if we want to i mean uh, right like if we're talking capacity like if we're talking capacity we can do anything we want we have icbms that'll reach around the planet like you know like in terms of what we can explicitly do like ability wise we can do anything in the world but we don't right yes that's correct yeah, so we, we, we don't, I think, because it's possible to build incentive structures that prevent us from engaging in those worst excesses. Okay, I think Mearsheimer correctly identifies the incentive structure when he's talking about uh, how the Ukraine is West, is the West's fault. So, okay, I'll, uh, I'll make you a concession here. Mearsheimer thinks that um, Putin is uh, purely rational. Uh, you make in your video the argument that uh, dictators have been known to do irrational things from time to time, that it's not uh, outside the realm of historical possibility. Um, I'll grant that. So it seems like we have two different worlds, right? If you can imagine two. In one, Putin is uh, Mearsheimer's very rational actor. In the second, he's your rational actor. Um, it seems like, given his language, uh, history, invasion of Ukraine, this was something that, uh, in the irrational world, Putin always does. In the rational world, okay, if the West, if you, okay, in the rational world, Putin is disincentivized or has no incentive to uh, attack Ukraine um, apart from his own personal feelings. But there's no direct pressure coming from uh, the possible threats that Ukraine poses to Russian uh, geopolitical interests. So it seems like if you want the best outcome in your world, the incursions and uh, trampling over Ukraine are guaranteed. In Mearsheimer's, there's a chance that Russia just doesn't see the need to. So it seems like the optimal thing to do, regardless of which world we live in, is to not give Russia the impression that Ukraine is going to be a hindrance on their geopolitical interests. Why? Because if you give Russia the impression that uh, Ukraine is going to bother them in some way or another, they are incentivized to invade. No, that's the opposite. If you have them join NATO, for example, you do the opposite, don't you? You create a disincentive. Under your framework, my logic is correct. If we assume that Putin is rational, the best thing we could do is make Ukraine a, a bramble patch that they have no reason to invade, right? Okay, so the U um, joining NATO is a, a separate argument. The Ukraine isn't in NATO uh, currently, and I don't think that um, not being yet. in or not Inshallah. being in NATO isn't re is relevant to Mearsheimer's argument. Well, he says that the West caused this, right? Yes, that's correct. But the West's unwillingness to say that Ukraine will never be a part of NATO is a contributor to this problem. Mm -hmm. Right. So it seems like then um, we should just bite the bullet. Have Ukraine join NATO. That way, if Russia invades, the world ends. It seems like so, a good way to disincentivize that behavior, no? I, um, I could agree. The Whether or not they should join NATO is a uh, separate uh, conversation that... Um, I would enjoy having with you in like 10 minutes, but um, mm -hmm. it isn't relevant to whether or not Mearsheimer is correct. He makes the argument that by giving Russia the incentive that Ukraine was going to uh, not necessarily join NATO, but uh, just westernize or become more westernly aligned, that you threatened Russian interests. And that's what caused uh, Russia to try and protect its interests. Well, I mean, sure, but like what Russia's interests are threatened by the whole of NATO as well. Should they not then also invade Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania? Go back to Poland? I mean, the limits of their interests surely are not contained merely to the country closest to them on the border. And they share a border with Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. So it seems Those like... protected by their current NATO status. Sure. So we should have let Ukraine into NATO, I agree. But by this logic you're employing right here, we never should have let them into NATO either. You're playing the game of appeasement, where... 
we can never even attempt to protect the countries closest to Russia, because if we fail to do so sufficiently, then we prompt Russia to engage in aggression. Even well, I though I would 100% agree with that right there. Right, if, but Russia would just aggress if we're not anyway. Absolutely, if we, I, um, I think the odds of NATO getting of um, Ukraine joining NATO were dubious, and um, so that noted. The fact that uh, we weren't sure that we were going to guarantee uh, NATO membership to Ukraine means that it was dangerous to suggest that they would get it before we were ready to fully commit to that. Because then you put them in this, in this awkward limbo stage where they're not yet protected, but they've just recently become a threat to Russia's geopolitical interests. So should we have just let Russia, like, control their government through um, through that uh, that puppet they had in 2014? Like, we should, we, should we just support, like complete complacency because if russia feels like they can't control all the countries around them that worsens their behavior that uh, seems like a non sequitur to what i just said well what you're saying is that these countries don't have a right to defend themselves and any no i've never talked about rights okay so I'm what you're saying is getting the best you're... outcomes for all countries and you're if there's saying... an outcome that increases your likelihood of getting invaded then we probably shouldn't pursue policy that leads to that outcome so you're saying then that um these countries should always engage in behavior which minimizes the chance of invasion from Russia, no matter what? I mean, uh, wouldn't you, if you were a country on Russia's border? Well, yeah, uh, well, in that case, shouldn't we just let Russia annex the entire planet? I... that seems like a, another non-sequitur. No, because what you're saying right now is that, like, the mere ex like, anything which prompts Russian aggression is bad, but Russian aggression is prompted by not having control over geopolitical enemies. So, as long as any country is a geopolitical enemy, or even just not an ally, there's a threat that they could oppose Russian geopolitical interests, which means that the logical thing for them to do under your framework would be to allow themselves to be conquered or annexed with no resistance whatsoever. The logic you're engaging in is fundamentally one of appeasement, one where Russia is... Now, you don't like the word entitled because it sounds like a moral claim, but you are making a moral claim because you're presupposing the moral value of doing anything possible to avoid future invasion, and that's something you can only justify morally. So you are uh, presupposing, then, um, the, the moral wrongness of any country standing up to any bigger country. And I think that logic is really, really destructive. It validates colonialism. We never would have escaped the 18th century if it were for logic like this, where any aggression or defense or resistance posed by countries with less geopolitical power is a sort of implicit justification. What if Russia would have invaded anyway? It's not like they haven't. Should we never protest against unjust systems because there might be a crackdown? I just don't know where this logic leads. Well, again, I think you're extrapolating what I've said to, uh, I think your extrapolations are outside of reason. My Do you think like Poland that, uh, should have just ceded to Nazi Germany? Again, I'd like to talk about Russia. Well, wait, do you think Poland should have just ceded to Nazi Germany? <laughs> no, I don't. Well, why not? I, I don't think that was in the best interests of Poland. Wh why, why not? They lost a lot of people trying to defend themselves, and it was pretty clear Germany considered Poland to be part of their legitimate territory. I am, uh... Where is the parallel that you're drawing between this and Ukraine? I I think the parallel is pretty clear, no? You're making the argument that a country engaging... I've never made any... hmm? oh, continue, continue. Let me hear it first. A country engaging in behavior which larger, more powerful neighbors might interpret as a threat is oh, bad. I've said nothing about what Ukraine ought to do. Like, try to join NATO? No, no, no. I, like, uh, I'm defending Mearsheimer's argument here. Mearsheimer makes the argument that the West is at fault for letting NATO flirt with, uh, I mean, for letting Ukraine flirt with NATO and EU membership. Because doing that put them in Russia's uh, line of sight in the target. But Ukraine also did that by ousting their 2014 leader and fighting against the, um, Russian separatists in the in the Donbass region for like eight years. Like Ukraine also prompted Russian aggression pretty hard here, way more than the West did. Why not just encourage Ukraine to roll over, right? Like just, like give up. Like Poland should have. <laughs> I mean, right? Uh, let me give, it, give me a second to reframe this. 
I think that there is good and bad policy making. For a country that we seem, given uh, current circumstances, unwilling to actually commit to defending, it seems like it was a uh, naive idea to suggest before we were ready to commit to protecting Ukraine that they would soon be a member. Well, doesn't that mean it also would have been wrong of us to support their ousting of the 2014 leader back then? Because we're also, in that case, indicating that we're leaning towards them. Or what about them trading with the EU? The EU was willing to trade with them. Like, it seems like anything the West did to show any friendliness to Ukraine was a prompt here. But, I mean, at that point, like, why not just blame Russia? Isn't Russia at fault? Like, they're the one actually doing it. Yeah, that. Russia is at fault. Well, then, I, um, Mir Shemai said the, the West is at fault, no. though. So... I, uh, I'm in Chicago here. If I walk around the city of Chicago with uh, what's expensive, like um, Canada Goose, AirPod Pros, and a Gucci wallet hanging out of my back pocket, I am eventually going to get mugged. Obviously, the mugger's the one responsible morally for the wrongdoing. But I think there's a, there's a fair bit of naivety and stupidity involved in putting yourself in situations that maximize the likelihood of your being mugged. Okay. So, like... Let's say we're making a statement then on who's at fault for such a situation. Do we say, like, Russia that person one. is at fault? Because Mearsheimer said the West is at fault. Mearsheimer uh, enjoys being inflammatory. Okay. So if we were to say change behavior in the future or affect policy to make, like, decisions down the line, would our decision, the policy we put forward, be, like, banning people with heavy wallets from walking in like downtown areas or would we if try I to got address back, i would hope that uh my friends here would try to prevent me from walking around south side chicago in this fashion because there is a behavior that i can personally modify my own and there is behavior that is outside the realms of my possibility to modify the muggers uh-huh i think you probably ought to maximize or to minimize the chances of your suffering catastrophic harm so, but this kind of implies then that, um, you know, the issue with this is that in the scenario you're posing, we're presupposing no real benefit to the right to carry a heavy wallet around a bad area of town. Whereas the alternative here is allow Ukraine to submit to Russian hegemonic power anyway. Ukraine has a pretty strong uh, incentive to engage in this riskier behavior anyway, because it seems like they're submissive you know, their, their submission to Russia is inevitable either way. Like, Russia's been trying to control Ukraine for decades now. They've been fighting a proxy war for eight years in the Donbass region, right? So it's not as though, like, Russia wasn't going to do this anyway. It seems like a lot of what's happening right now was inevitable. And I think you're kind of ceding to Russian propaganda to say that Russia's genuinely only, only doing this because, like, NATO won't refuse to keep their hands off. The only reason Russia doesn't want Ukraine to join NATO is because that would prevent Russia from conquering NATO. Or, sorry, um, from conquering Ukraine. There are, uh, you, Bosh, you have to be able to think of uh, other hindrances on Russian foreign policy than having a NATO member at your doorstep with uh, control of um, your only warm water port would have. Like what? Imagine Russia gets in gets in conflict with another country on, a, on a, one of its other borders. Uh, now you have NATO members, um, and presumably, you know, a now uh, country that's now part of the Western world, so to speak, that uh, can attempt to limit um, the influx of, uh, of goods to your country, shipping. So um, wouldn't they just try your, to conquer oh. Ukraine anyway? Because what you're describing anyway, right I, now is an incentive to control Ukraine directly anyway. I think, okay, so... Russia faces a cost for the invasion. So a Ukraine that's relatively compliant is less likely to get invaded. I don't think that so Ukrainians we... have some responsibility to be compliant, but I think that the West's action in putting them in a state of risk um, by continuously offering up and not committing to- we didn't, Wait, we didn't membership. put them in that state of risk. They want to be in that state of risk. We're in compliance with Ukraine's government in doing this. If they're making attempts to join NATO, we're not at fault. Like, we're ceding to their demands. You can't, like, you can't deny them their agency. If Ukraine wants to join NATO, we're, like, we're not at fault for, 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 like, hearing them out. Clearly, their attempt, their indication that they won't submit to Russia, that, that's going to happen anyway, right?
Did it cut? Briefly, I didn't hear you for a second. Oh, yeah, my audio cut too. Um, what was the last thing you said there? I said it seems like Ukraine was making it pretty clear that they were defying Russian geopolitical interests anyway. Like, don't deny them their agency. Ukraine wants to be a part of NATO. Ukraine wants us to not deny them a future seat at the table with NATO. Like, I feel like this... Like, I'm going to be honest, okay? I think the real position Mearsheimer and possibly you has is that Ukraine is asking for it and they kind of deserve what's happening to them. But that sounds horrible. So instead, you're giving way too much agency to the West for very simply not allowing Russia to dictate whether or not other countries can join NATO, a precedent they would never let another country set in a million years because that would be psychotic. In what world do you let a country outside of a treaty determine which other countries get to sign? Like, that would never happen. So by weirdly invoking the agency of the West as the predominant force here, you essentially get to blame Ukraine for everything Ukraine has done and wants to do, but like in less psychotic language. Does that make any sense? Like it's, it seems really weird. I don't know. I, uh, I would agree that it seems really weird. I uh, don't think that I've blamed Ukraine for anything. I uh, agree that Russia is morally at fault. So it, uh, it seems odd to try to pin me down as a uh, victim blaming in this situation. I mean, what you did was explicitly victim blaming. You compared it to how you need to hold a person who's mugged responsible for being mugged. I, mean, I never said you need to hold them responsible. I said that ideally people minimize the likelihood that they suffer harm. Ideally, but in this case, we're not just talking about the right to walk with a fat wallet around downtown. This is something they need to do. This would be like blaming a refugee who has no house and carries everything they own on their back for getting mugged. Like Ukraine has if, to do this. If we put it in terms of probability, do you think that might help? So let's say, you know, there's a, a world in which the uh, 2008 Bucharest conference never happens. Mm -hmm. There aren't uh, these loud overtures of possible Ukrainian membership in NATO in the future. If in that world there were a 5% lower chance that Russia invades, do you think that would have been uh, the West's better call is to not say anything? No. Why would the West ever allow Russia, which is the only reason NATO exists, to decide for another country whether that country gets to be a part of the That's defensive right. pact, which exists because people don't want to be invaded by Russia? Like, you realize how crazy that is, right? Like, if you want to talk about the rights of geopolitical hegemons to enact their authority and force in areas they control, why the like, fuck would NATO right. ever allow that to happen? It, uh, so you would live in the world where Ukraine is more likely to get invaded? You're presupposing that. I, like, Russia was already trying to control Ukraine. This invasion I is am. only the most overt form of the many attempts they've made in the past to try to submit Ukraine to their will. This is the most I direct thing. It. That's the point of a hypothetical. Sure. Well, I mean, in that case, I think the invasion would have happened either way. Like, maybe they shouldn't have ousted that leader in 2014 and just, like, let themselves be a Russian puppet by that logic. Sure. Maybe the invasion is something necessary. America, the colonies, never would have fought against Britain if we hadn't wanted revolution. Poland, they could have just surrendered. Like, yeah, you can always surrender, but sometimes it's worth it to fight. Would, would life really be better for Ukraine, not for this invasion, but rather under a hundred years of despotism, of corruption, of economic deprivation, and of oppression from the Russian government? Maybe this war is their, like, their big hurrah, their chance to break the back of the Russian wannabe empire, a chance for them to break free and truly define themselves, not just as some post-Soviet breakaway state, but as a real, definitive, unique country. Uh, that can stand up on its own against Russia. And I can if, agree to all of this. That's I still the case, believe that's in Mearsheimer's argument, right? And that the conflict that uh, ends up in your world freeing the Ukrainian people, uh, which is the ideal outcome, um, would in part have been uh, in at least 5%, so to speak, incited by Western overtures towards Ukraine. I, I don't think your position, Mearsheimer's, are incompatible. Well, if that's the case, then the West being at fault for, for what's happening right now would be a good thing. Our support of Ukraine is directly what's led to this surge of national approval and revitalization. So okay. if, the, if the West maybe wants to was... take credit for the good, I mean... Maybe that was the issue from the beginning, was uh, my framing of it. I... it. That seems to me like what Mearsheimer's argument is. Having spoken to him personally, it's, uh, his argument is that the conflict is a result, in part, not completely, of Western foreign policy. I think that's hard to contest. Oh, yeah, but is a result of and is the fault of are two different things. Everything that fault happens in charged, the world... But they essentially mean the same thing. No, everything in if the world is a result things. of... 
everything in the world is the result of stuff the West does geo geopolitically. We're the strongest. And everything in the world is the fault of stuff the West does geopolitically, okay. so to speak, right? Then you can say that about any, well, then it's a meaningless statement. If you're going to reduce is the fault of to is caused by, and everything is caused by to some extent or another Western actions, then everything is the fault of the West and all political nuance or ability to describe anything is, is dead. Like, like, I don't get what the point of that is. Like at that point, like what are you even saying, right? Like what? What's the objective okay, so of the statement? I'll defend the use of the word fault here because it seems like uh, Mearsheimer and many agree that invasion is bad. If the war were going differently right now and Russia were just carpet bombing Ukraine, I'm sure you would be much more inclined to think that invasion is bad. Uh, it's probably a result of um, Ukraine's I do think it's bad. startling success that you're able to take this, you know, oh, maybe this is their freedom moment, their 13 colonies moment, um, which is why you dislike the use of the word fault, because no, this even, seems like a even if Ukraine was, right now. Even if Ukraine was crushed into dust with no time or effort at all, I would still support everything that happened beforehand. I do not think it's acceptable for NATO to be bullied into denying other countries being threatened with invasion by Russia into not joining the anti-Russia defensive pact. That's insane. Bullying is doing a lot of the heavy lifting in that sentence. It seems like there's tactful decision making to be made. Russia um, is trying to bully. Know. Russia was bullying Ukraine into not joining it. That's not arguable. They were clearly doing so. That doesn't make it good policy to... Uh, it, do, it makes it bad policy to cede to that, that bullying. Moment. It's appeasement. Don't cede to the bullying. I think... Standing up to the bully when you're not willing to confront him seems like a recipe for disaster. The they West were. was not going to... Ukraine has been ready to fight and confront for a long time. No, we're talking about the West right now. The West did not end up taking uh, Ukraine into NATO. It didn't offer them the protection that it... Um, Suggested they might have, nah, and that's we're, the reason we're, helping. we're getting invaded at the moment. We're helping, though. I'm very glad. Right. So it seems like we're doing what we can. Ukraine's doing what they can, right? Like we we can't we couldn't have just brought them into NATO right then because that would have meant bringing troops right up to the Donbass region. We were incapable of bringing them into NATO right then. Oh dear. Um, you think there's a, a world in which the timing of um, NATO statements, um, EU decisions, was is better? I mean, I can imagine a world in which literally everything can be improved. I think what they did was reasonable. I think it was good and better than the alternative you're offering. The alternative of uh, waiting till you're actually able to commit to defending an ally? So what do you, what do you mean by that? We, at yeah. no point, there's no world in which NATO troops ever go to the Don Donbass region. That, that will never happen. I mean, not yeah. until the, the Russian separatists are out of there. The first um, big controversial mention of Ukraine joining NATO was in 2008, prior to the uh, invasion of the Uk of um, the Crimea. Yeah, and at the time we um, we weren't willing to. Commit. I think at the time speaking might have been a little irresponsible. No, what what's wrong with hearing Ukraine's interest in joining NATO, but deciding it's no. not time yet? They stated explicitly that uh, Ukraine and Georgia would be joining NATO at some point in the future. Sure, that might still be the case. So there is no world in which it's irresponsible to make that statement. No, no. How is it? This is just standard diplomacy. Diplomacy is just seeing, saying whatever you feel at that particular moment N out loud. No, D diplomacy is we might be interested in bringing you into the North Atlantic Treaty Alliance sometime or organization in the future, but at the moment we don't want to. I, 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 that this happens all the time. With this has happened to other countries in NATO. Hello. Yeah, I'm trying to think of um. Oh wait, you cut out for like a second. You, you cut out for a second. All I heard was, uh, "Could you repeat what you said?" Since my last words. What did uh? What did, what did you last year? I, I didn't hear much for a good while there. Just everything you said after you last heard me talk, please. Oh, okay, wait, let me check uh, the wire here. Is, uh, it's not disconnecting anymore, right? No, I, I think that might have been an internet hiccup. Um, oh, that's probable. It's a uh, college Wi-Fi. Um, so what were we talking? You were talking about... Uh... Yeah, like, it's just diplomacy. Like, you know, um, we, we don't want you to let you into NATO right now, but, like, maybe in the future. That stuff happens all the time with other countries that are in NATO 
currently and countries that join the EU and all that stuff. It's just standard stuff, you know? It takes a lot of time to work out those deals. People want to see where the pieces fall. Th th this is very standard stuff. Like, flat out denying, like, no, you will never be a part of NATO. Like, that would be very weird. That would be, like, the strange thing to do, you know? Would a non-answer maybe have been better? No. Isn't... No? No. Saying, yeah, we will have you in the future. That's fine. I don't, I don't have an issue with this. Even if it uh, results in the world where the Ukraine is more likely to get invaded? Um, yeah, because the alternative is to um, wish-wash about who gets to join defensive treaties because we're so worried about Russia invading, which kind of defeats the point of a defensive treaty if we make our international relations decisions around who gets to join it based around who Russia is willing to bully at the time. If that was, the, It's not like Russia wanted Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania to join either. Like, you know... We, we can't do everything, uh, you know, like worrying if those lunatics are just going to press the red button over it, right? Like, we, we, we have to make these decisions. If you knew deterministically that uh, NATO was not going to end up um, in adopting, letting uh, Ukraine join, um, and they made these overtures that increased their likelihood of coming into confrontation with Russia, would you still have supported the language? Yes. I do. So I, like, under no so circumstances am I acceptable with Russia getting to dictate who will later join the defensive treaty, which is protecting countries from Russia. I think you seem really fixated on uh, this uh, dictate thing. You are it, uh, letting Russia dictate it. Yeah, like you're saying, like, because Russia is antagonistic and violent and threatening and they're going to invade, which is psychotic, by the way, like invading neighboring countries because you're afraid their geopolitical interests might trend away from yours. Like... We're not exactly defending peachy, clean behavior here. Um, or sorry, not, not defending, defending not defending, rationalizing okay. and um, legitimizing through calling it inevitable. Um, I, I, I like using moralistic language because I don't like pretending that all this shit is like inevitable. I'm okay morally denouncing this behavior. Um, you said earlier in the stream that you thought Russia's invasion was inevitable. Um, treating it, it yeah, treating something as inevitable and therefore you have to roll over to it though is appeasement. Like again, why shouldn't Poland have just rolled over, right? Or like all the other countries that fought against Nazi Germany? I think that would be the right of the countries to decide. Well, Ukraine decided not to and Ukraine wants us to support them one day joining NATO, so... Ukraine In wanted to join NATO. They didn't want us to make big overtures and not follow through. I assume they would have really enjoyed being in NATO, what, four, five, six years ago? I'm sure that if you ask the people of Ukraine and also um, their leadership, they would not say, yes, we sure do wish the West had flatly said, um, we will never join NATO. For Christ's sake, Zelensky is asking America to like, like give more support to the war effort right now. They're clearly not afraid of indicating they want the West to show as much support for Ukraine as possible. They've already been invaded. Yeah. They no longer increase the likelihood of being attacked. To they were asking the for support months before the invasion. Because they believe the invasion to be coming uh, intelligence such as the invasion oh, wait how long ago are you talking what's your time frame in months years ukraine has been asking for assistance from the west for years they've been invaded since 2014 this is just like the big the big follow through but they've been very consistent in demanding or requesting as much help as possible from western governments since the invasion of crimea yeah yeah mirshammer's argument is it's pre crimea or it's not it, it's uh, it relates to crimea he thinks that uh, Russia's invasion of Crimea was a result of... Well, yeah, because ambition. you're buying into Russian propaganda. Russia just wants to invade neighboring countries. As long as those countries are not currently submitting fully to Russian will, Russia will invade them or do whatever they can to submit them to their power. We so saw this in I'm Hungary before. I'm inclined to agree with you on this, but it's impossible to know the uh, thought processes. Or is it impossible, what do you always say, to inductively reason the, uh, the thoughts of a particular individual? Okay, so let's say, let's say we want to free Ukraine. How do we get a, how, like, what behavior should we engage in as the West if we want to free Ukraine? We couldn't have just had them join NATO after 2014 because it's the policy of NATO to not admit countries currently undergoing what's termed as a civil war. Um, especially since that quote-unquote civil war had Russian soldiers on one side of it. That would have been pretty bad for NATO. So, um, like, outside of just letting them into NATO against NATO's policies, what could we have possibly done there? I don't think we can debate this uh, in a post-Crimea, since Mearsheimer was arguing that Russia's invasion of Crimea is a response to um, attempts to westernize Ukraine. It was, an, it was a response to the ousting of their puppet.
that's pretty ex like Russia basically admitted that like that's what it was a response to. And How is that the West's fault? I think it's very likely that you're correct uh, in your assessment of uh, Putin's motivations, but um, it's impossible to know them inductively, which is why I made the uh, the two worlds analogy earlier. With with that respect, like there was a pro-Russian leader who led who who had protests against him. Putin directly told him to crack down harder on the protests, and then he was ousted and fled to Russia, and then immediately afterwards they annexed Crimea and, like, started deploying separatist groups in the Donbass region. I don't think we have to engage in that much of an inferential leap to understand what Russia was responding to here. It wasn't NATO, it was Ukraine not being their puppet state. Um, again, I'll say that I agree with that assessment. I think it's the most likely. Uh, but there are possibilities that... Now, how did I frame it earlier? Um, oh, okay. So even if we concede that, I think it's... Okay. In your world, whatever the West does is irrelevant because um, Russia is going to invade Ukraine due to its, its puppet, his puppet getting ousted. Right? Yeah, well, Russia... Uh, invasion... Only if other things don't work. Clearly, this was a last resort. But yeah, I think that I think Russia was committed to any policy set which would allow them to bring Ukraine to heel, um, and that the invasion was just the last resort they arrived at because the other attempts have failed. You know, um, assassination attempts. Uh, uh, you know, trying to starve out the country, trying to bully them, threaten them, funding separatist region like groups. You know, all that crap. Like that all, that all failed. Um, so now they're relying on So is the fear this. of Ukraine trying to westernize uh, that prompted the Russian invasion of Crimea, since they no longer had control of the government? Yeah. Well, they so, were going to westernize anyway, right? The only countries that don't westernize, like, it, it, certainly in Europe, are ones that don't okay. have a choice to. We make a lot more money than Russia does. It's just a strong economic incentive. Westernized in an economic sense, sure, but um, I, th I think becoming Western aligned is uh, different from Westernizing, so to speak. Well, Ukraine was clearly going to do both. Ukraine fucking hates Russia. Like, Ukrainians despise Russia. They were subjected to, like, a, a century of tyranny, you know. Um, in a world where the West had re rebuffed those efforts to become Western aligned, no, we if there were a slightly smaller likelihood of Russia taking Crimea or becoming involved since they felt more secure, would that be preferable? No. The state of affairs which brings about the best outcomes on average is ones in which countries with sovereignty defend themselves against attempts at invasion, and the world supports them in doing so. We never would have gotten out of the colonial period if we hadn't had this mindset. Like, yeah, we should support weaker countries trying to establish sovereignty in opposition to stronger countries, you know? Why not? Regardless of what happens. As a rule, we should support that. We can't see the future, but... Um, yeah, that we sh we absolutely should, of course, because otherwise we're gonna all we're gonna do every time is be head scratching over it. Like, okay, well, should Poland really like? Should we really declare war on Germany to defend Poland? Poland's much weaker, and like Germany clearly wants Poland, and maybe after this third conquest they'll give up. Like, you could do that forever, but it's like it's just a it's just a bad set of policies. It's apologism. It it, it defers to the hegemon, the eternal right to do what they will. Because criticizing them is framed as some kind of, you know, utopian moral problem you have with the inevitable right of big countries to bully small countries. I just don't think that's true. Not inevitable right, inevitable likelihood. Then you fight against it when it's likely. Every time. So it seems like the West's attempts to make these overtures to help Ukraine were not particularly helpful. It ended up getting invaded. Well, they would have been a lot more helpful than not doing anything at all. What, uh, would the world be worse if uh, the West hadn't done any of this? I think so, yeah. We would have abandoned a country in need to be swallowed up by a much more powerful neighbor. That's assuming that uh, in this other world, Putin feels the need to invade. Well, maybe not invade, but bring Ukraine to heel, yes. Maybe he could have done that by installing another puppet. Maybe he could have, you know... If the EU wasn't willing to, like, make negotiations with Ukraine, maybe, like, Ukraine would have been so broke they would have had no choice but to accept exploitative um, and manipulative trade deals from Russia, you know? Like, that's possible. But I don't... I, don't... So I, think, I think you agree with Mearsheimer here, then. 
Maybe not in his prescription that it was uh, wrong or irresponsible of the United States, of the West, to um, make these overtures, but in that their, the West's having done so increased the likelihood that this conflict was going to happen, and so is in part uh, the West's fault. This, if by this conflict you mean the invasion, then no, I dis like if, if by if by the invasion I mean, I mean, uh, exclusively. The invasion. Huh? Does uh, does it make a difference if I mean Crimea or uh, the invasion here? Well, like if you want to maximize for behavior that prevents any kind of invasion, then Ukraine should just let it themselves become like a vassal state. That would have that would have negated the possibility of invasion because it would have been Russian land to be invaded, right? Like, like if we want to see, like, what, you're you're ignoring all moral considerations except for the moral presupposition that it's good to avoid an invasion, which I disagree with. I think invasions if they happen sometimes, can be a necessary and sometimes beneficial part of defending country sovereignty. Um, I'd agree with that. Yeah, so like in, in this in this case, like it, with regards to um, with regards to Ukraine and like, well, whether or not Crimea would have happened, like, I mean, I guess they could have just languished under Russian hegemony with no autonomy, but I'm glad that they've stood up and fight. I think, um, so there's certainly, uh, no, I don't want to, hmm. No, I'll uh, leave that out for now. Um, but so you do agree with Mearsheimer then, that there is well, a, no. some level of responsibility that the West bears for the outcomes? N no. Well, again, if we want to use the definition where the West is at fault means the West is responsible, and by responsible we mean the behavior of the West affected the outcome, then I agree with Mirshimer in saying that everything that has ever happened since, like, the end of the Cold War is so the West's fault. you don't West's agree with fault. him in his argument. You disagree with him on whether or not uh, a Russian invasion is uh, acceptable. Does he believe it's acceptable? No. Well, he, do I believe it is? His to minimize the invasion is to minimize the likelihood of conflict. Okay, so and I have to ask like you again. To some level of conflict. Why shouldn't Poland have just surrendered? Like, should the United uh, States have not provided? Not want to. Okay, Sh was it wrong of the United States to provide arms, weapons, um, to uh, to the Allied powers before we got involved in the war directly? I wouldn't say so. No. Why not? If we, uh, us giving them weaponry prolongs the war and delays them simply surrendering. If we want to minimize the amount of invasion taking place, we should want the war to be brought about to its end as quickly as possible, no? Are you asking my opinion personally or to defend Mearsheimer's argument? I, I mean, I, I guess, but do you, if you agree with Mearsheimer, those two things should be one and the same, no? Oh, I don't particularly agree with Mearsheimer. I, uh, I'm not even a big realist. All right. So, I, uh, was it wrong of us to give arms? Tactics. Uh, to give arms to the allies? To the allied powers, yeah. It I wasn't like it was clear not. they were going to win. No, I think it was uh, pretty morally justifiable. Aren't aren't we just prolonging conflict in the region? By, uh... You're talking about Ukraine now? Well, well no. In, in Europe, during World War II. Are we prolonging... Conflict in the region by providing arms. Okay, if if the moral presupposition here is that providing support increases the likelihood of other countries engaging in violent behavior against the countries we're supporting, then by that logic, France should never have aided the U.S. colonists fighting against England. America shouldn't have provided arms and aid to the countries that were fighting the Axis powers. Like, it seems to me like this would lead to a lot of really bad outcomes potentially. So I think all those countries acted in their own self-interest when they engaged in this support, right? The West acted in its own self-interest when it stood by Ukraine and refused yeah. to deny them. Right. And Ukraine acted in its own self-interest when it continued to pursue NATO. So if that's the case, if we're all acting in our own self-interest here, why the fuck are we blaming the West? So Mearsheimer thinks that it would be... it. The decisions made increase the likelihood of conflict in the region. Okay, wait. And that it's our self-interest. You you can't you can't like make moral claims after saying that you're doing a realist perspective on this, right? Like if every inst if every group here is acting in their own like self interest, then why are we deciding that the West is at fault?
you know? Like, Why is the West specifically and not Ukraine? Yeah, well, yeah, if all countries involved are acting in their own self-interest by your admission and by their engagement, why would you ever do a, a speech, or like a lecture, on how the West is at fault? Like, doesn't that seem like some weird pro-Russian bias? Like, because he doesn't say that either. He doesn't say all countries involved are acting in their own self-interest. He says that Russia's self-interest owes them a natural hegemonic control over the region of Ukraine. So I from Mearsheimer to get this idea that he's pro-Russian out of your head. I've got to, from one of his interviews. Oh, I don't care what he says about Russia. His framing about this posed Russian geopolitical interests as this inevitable defensible thing the West has to back off of. But for some reason, our geopolitical interests aren't something they have to back off of, off of or Ukraine's for that matter. He is making a moral statement. He's just pretending that he's not, which really frustrates me about him and a lot of other people who do this. And what's the moral statement that he makes? The idea that we're, we're presupposing the value of Russia's geopolitical interests over the West's by saying that the West is at fault when all parties involved are acting in their geopolitical interest. The realist argument should be that you want to organize affairs in such a way that all um, uh, geopolitical interests are accounted for to minimize conflict. But if that's the case, Russia should have kept their hands off. Ukraine, after 2014, was very clearly siding with the West and has only done more so since then. Russia was the one that violated the realist pact not the West, who was incentivized to engage in the support for Ukraine, and certainly not Ukraine, which is obviously incentivized to defend itself. Is realism necessary to your argument here? It's necessary to his argument. I'm not a realist. I make moral claims. So does he, but he pretends that he's not. So Mishan would say that uh, the United States has no uh, interest in Ukraine we, cle we clearly do. We're giving them tens of billions of dollars. Obviously, we, we clearly, clearly do. Political decisions are different. Countries uh, don't... Okay. How best to frame this? Um... No, the United States isn't particularly affected by whether or not Ukraine is taken. We clearly we can, are. as a political decision, make, well, uh, give them arms, but um, from a purely realist perspective, uh, our control, um, our uh, integrity of our hegemony isn't uh, affected by Russia's taking Ukraine. Well, first of all, hold on. You don't get to decide what is or isn't in the interest of a country. Maybe there are other political considerations beyond merely having access to resources in Ukraine. Now, Ukraine does, of course, have a huge amount of black soil and natural gas and stuff like that, but maybe America, which is aligned with NATO, doesn't want Russia to normalize invading nearby countries or exerting control over them. Like, don't you think it's in NATO and Europe's interest broadly to not have Russia just encroach on the second largest country in all of Europe? moving westward okay, and matching border on. with more NATO countries. Yeah, that's um okay, so acting acting in your own self-interest um politically isn't necessarily realism. Is realism just whatever's most convenient at the time? The, the, no, I, no, no. No, like I, uh, what, how is it not in the interests well. of NATO aligned countries to not have Russia control Ukraine? That's clearly getting closer to our turf. That's uh not our turf, so to speak. It, well, hold on, that's for us to decide. Our interests aren't determined by what your, like, abacus tells us they are. At, like, like it's very simple. You know, like, hey, NATO member, do you want you, uh, Russia to just get 400 miles closer and now match borders with Poland, a country that hates Russia and is also a NATO member? Well, no, that would actually be really bad for us in every imaginable way. Do we want to cut off trade relationships with Ukraine, which has a massive number of, like, natural resources and a quickly industrializing post-Soviet economy? Well, no. So, yeah, it is in our geopolitical interest to make sure that Ukraine doesn't fall to Russia. The world is our geopolitical interest. That's why I don't get this, like, territorial hegemony thing. There's no such thing as it anymore. So, acting in your own self-interest, what, uh, what do you think realism is? At, at this point, I don't know. You're going to have to help me with that one. Um, I can give you uh, Mearsheimer's description, which some other realists disagree with. There's a, a whole bunch of sub-varieties of realists, and uh, they're not particularly fond of each other. Well, yeah, hit me up. Okay, so Mearsheimer is uh, what's called an offensive realist. Uh, it's a type of structural realism that uh, 
says that um, you know uh, conflict between states outcomes are more or less uh, predictable, predictable and inevitable results of uh, the system um, of, uh, of international affairs at the time. So it starts from uh, something like five. Oh, actually, I've got it right here. It starts from five basic assumptions. Uh, one, that the international system is anarchic. There's no higher authority, which is uh, true. There isn't anybody to regulate the fighting of states between each other. They're, uh, it's, uh, the international system isn't hierarchic. There isn't uh, an authority that can overrule or rein in states. Um, second, that all states have some offensive capacity, which seems reasonable. Uh, three, that you can never be certain about the intentions of other states, which again seems fairly reasonable. Um, four, that survival is the main goal of states. Um, and five, that states are rational actors. Um, rationality is hotly debated and uh, a little outside uh, what... Uh, yeah, none of that, that conflicts with my belief that Ukraine's independence from Russia is in the interest of NATO countries, like in their geopolitical interest. Yeah, you just asked me to explain what uh, realism was. Yes, I'm just saying, if, if all involved have geopolitical interests to, to Ukraine, and if our geopolitical interests are the more ethical ones because they involve the freedom of the Ukrainian people and Russia's doesn't, it seems to me like if everyone's interested in Ukraine and conflict over Ukraine is pretty much a, a guarantee, considering Russia's plans for Ukraine have been, well, long brewing to say the least, um, the best thing that we can do is decide which, uh, you know, which attitude causes the less, like the least harm, which geopolitical bloc will do the least harm to Ukraine. And since Russia is the one doing the invading, <laughs> I think the argument there has been settled um, for which power alignment is more harmful to the Ukrainian people. So we should, you know, do everything we can to support the westernization of Ukraine, right? So the prediction made by um, Mearsheimer's branch of realism is that uh, states constantly seek hegemony because that's the best way to guarantee your safety. So, you know, the United States isn't threatened by anybody uh, in the Western Hemisphere because we're the regional hegemon. So states uh, will fight viciously to maintain their hegemony. Um, and that's uh, the framework under which he predicts predicted um, Russian attempts to take Ukraine uh, in response to the threatened sense of hegemony that they felt when overtures or when uh, Ukraine appeared like it would be joining NATO. When when Ukraine exercised autonomy as a country by ousting the puppet authoritarian. Exactly. Right. So, yeah, okay. So this seems fairly straightforward. Dictators will invade when they can't control yeah. what they want to control. So how does this, how, how should Poland have not surrendered to Hitler? No, it's uh, it's not a moral framework. It's just an analytical one. It's it, all uh, just moral. makes predictions. So, okay, so we're making predictions then. Well, I agree with mm -hmm. the prediction that Russia was going to do everything that it could to take Ukraine. So yes. with, with, with that presupposed, which seems to have been the case, you know, clearly, like this invasion was a pretty bad idea and they went ahead with it anyway. Not that uh, Russia was going to do everything it could to take Ukraine, that um, Russia is most incentivized to take Ukraine when it feels like Ukraine threatens its regional hegemony. Right, but they're a dictatorship, so yeah. threatening their hegemony is just not agreeing with them. Exactly. Right, so, yeah. So, so Russia was going to do this. So um, there are different levels of threat that a country can pose, right? I, Ukraine joining NATO would pose as much of a threat as Ukraine joining the, the European Union, because the only meaningful thing being denied Russia there is land and economic access. NATO will never invade Russia, so Russia doesn't pose an actual military threat. Uh, sorry, NATO doesn't pose an actual military threat to Russia. It's just a, a misdirection. Okay, but in, uh, in Mearsheimer's framework, states fight violently to maintain their hegemony. So having another NATO, uh, NATO member on your border means that you are now uh, not vulnerable to invasion, uh, but your interests in other regions can more easily be stymied. Okay. Well, that's a good thing. Yeah, it, I, I would agree that it's a good thing that Russia's interests can't be uh, acted on. I would like Ukraine to be in NATO. Yeah. We, we couldn't do that after Crimea, certainly. We don't normally rush countries into NATO access, certainly not when they're like on the border with Russia the way Ukraine is. That's... That would have been a pretty big jump, a pretty big, you know, addition to the NATO roster. So we took the our time. The problem is that they were 
six years between when um, we first announced that Ukraine would be joining NATO and Crimea. It seems like we left them out. Uh, Can I be in forthcoming for quite some time? Yeah, for sure. I'm 100% positive that if we had just let Ukraine into NATO way back then, and aggression had happened anyway with Russia funding the separatists, we would still have like nuclear brinksmanship from Russia, and Mearsheimer would still be saying that it's the West's fault. I, I really genuinely feel like this posturing that oh, he our mistake he doesn't think was... Ukraine should be in NATO. Right, wait, if so if he doesn't think Ukraine should be in NATO at all, then why are we talking about whether or not... Then why are we talking about whether or not, like, we fucked up by not letting them in? Like, because his argument was NATO should never have gone past its post-Cold War borders. Like, I don't know why we're yeah. doing this, like... Our, like, if you're standing for his argument, his argument is not the West made a mistake by not letting Ukraine into NATO in 2008. That's definitely not something he believes. Why shouldn't NATO the encompass the world? The argument is that the West made a mistake by teasing Ukraine with NATO, a country that it seemed that it was never going to adopt, nor uh, was it willing to defend, to die defending. We're not teasing. We just said, like, we will in the future. That's not weird. It's pretty normal. And also, his argument was that NATO should accede to Russian demands and go all the way back to its 1991 borders. He's not just saying we shouldn't have, like, not... We, he's not just saying we shouldn't have, like, looked at Ukraine with NATO interest. He was saying that, like, flat out, like, NATO should not have moved past, like, Germany. Yeah, he doesn't think that uh, those regions along the border of Russia are of uh, vital strategic interest to the United States. Well, isn't that convenient to Russia that his extremely not moral, arbitrary, realist designation of which countries and which hundreds of millions of people are or are not worth defending just so happens to benefit Russia's imperialist interests? See, this is what I mean by realism cloaking moral arguments, you know, because now anyone arguing for Russian invasion gets to make a moral argument. Oh, look, see? Western hegemony overextended past the Iron Curtain. See? They shouldn't have done this. Mersheimer says this directly. He says, you know, this is the West's fault. Like, the West shouldn't have done this. Well, if they shouldn't have done this, then Russia is acting, you know, morally correctly when it exhibits geopolitical um, control to try and establish hegemon in former, like, USSR territories. I mean, it really seems to kind of be benefiting the imperialists there, no? I think it has been spun in such a way that uh, it's been adopted by a lot of uh, disseminators of Russian propaganda. Yeah, you can look in the Mirsheim comments of that told. YouTube video and you're going to find a lot of people who are defending Russia right now. Uh, yeah, I Because uh, that's what it does. That that's the alarming. consequence of that language. It's a moral argument, you know? Like, so, Mirsheimer, Mirsheimer is like the equivalent of the guys who say, like, I'm not racist and I don't have any, like, positions on the hereditary differences between races and human intelligence. However, here's an eight hour YouTube video on like IQ tests done in the 1960s, which show definitively that like black Africans are less intelligent than white people. Um, but like, I have no opinions on this. Now, now go forth everyone else, you know, like I see what I Mershimer feel like this is, is rather doing. analogous. I think it's pretty analogous. Why should NATO is retreat it? to the Iron Curtain? That's a separate argument from whether that's, this is analogous. His goal is to critique U.S. strategy that he feels increased the likelihood that NATO, uh, I mean, that uh, the Ukraine be invaded. Right. You that, want appeasement. Uh, yeah. All he says. Don't do things that are morally good because the bad dictators will, will not like it if you do the morally good things. Like, that is by definition appeasement. There's not really another way around that. Is there uh, anything that is uh, morally good that you would choose not to do because of its consequences? The, the morally good thing is the consequences here. I mean, I'm a consequentialist. The morally good thing would be for NATO to expand. But you're, this okay, is, this is the fake inevitability Ukraine again. Now. This is the, you know, oh, I'm not racist. It's just a historical inevitability that different races can't live together. So when you say that my decisions are immoral, I'm not even making a moral statement. Like, that's the issue I have. Like, again, like, let's, like, let's just focus on the ethics because that's really what we're talking about. Anytime we make, like, statements about what should be we're making ethical statements and Mershimer does so we shouldn't let's not it's not math like he's inventing the guidelines based on moral preconceptions we, he can't like make up a rule set and then go oh well this is the objective rules you know does that, does so, that make um, sense yeah I see what you're saying um 
the response that uh, he gave when asked this exact question pretty much um, in an er interview with the, the New Yorker, I think, was, um, uh, I think there is a strategic and moral dimension involved with almost every issue in international politics. I think that sometimes those moral and strategic dimensions line up with each other. In other words, if you're fighting Nazi Germany, um, there are other occasions where those errors point in opposite directions, where what you're doing is strategically right and morally wrong. If you think join an alliance with the Soviet Union to fight against Nazi Germany. It's a strategically wise policy, but a morally wrong policy. But you do it because you have no choice for strategic reasons. Okay, so... Do you think there's like, separation should... between strategic interests and moral interests? Well, I mean, everything is an ethical question. So, I, I mean, you could say, like, strategic interests would be a subset of moral arguments that you make. Or you say that, That's like, strategic true. arguments that you make have a moral component to them. But they're all there. Um, the, the, again, the problem is, like, Mirshimer is just laying out arguments for, like, Russian imperialism and then cloaking them as, well, it's historically inevitable that Russia gets to do what they want with these territories, which I just strongly disagree with. That language disincentivizes other countries from intervening to help. And who's to say... Do that you think when I, hmm? when I made the argument about uh, the mugger that I was, uh, it, it's, it's cloaked uh, mugger apologism? Yes. Not cloaked. Oh, wow. Yes. It's uh, brazen mugger apologism. Yes. Am I, do you think it would be morally wrong of me to recommend to my friends they dress more discreetly and not wander the South Side for extended periods of time? So the diff so it's possible to take measures in order to prevent bad things from happening. But when we're talking yep. about broader policies for affecting social change, the solution to mugging is not uh, take defensive measures. The solution to mugging is address the existence of crime. It's the same with rape, right? Like, Wait, can we do that to Russia? Can we the, uh, uh, address the existence of Russia? Oh yeah, we can. We can address oh, the wow. likelihood of them engaging in violence by crushing their geopolitical hegemony, like what we're doing right now. We st we're gonna we're gonna break their backs in Ukraine um, and uh, show them what happens when they wage a war without America's consent. That's the thing we're doing right now. And that, by the way, I think what's happening right now is going to lead to better outcomes. Better we break them now, have Putin kill himself in a bunker somewhere, um, than uh, let them continue getting away with this behavior for decades and decades. This is the best case scenario as far as I'm concerned. Admittedly, if Ukraine had instantly lost, it would have been worse. But I still think the, the what would you say, the process-oriented outcome would have been preferable in that case because I don't think there are any long-term benefits to appeasement as a geopolitical strategy. Okay, I can agree to that. Yeah, it's not. I, I'm not. I'm not trying to accuse you of being like morally well, duplicitous I'll, I'll here, because I genuinely part. don't but, think uh, that you are. I just think it's like there there are issues with framing these things as inevitable because it it it, it kind of like seeds moral ground to people who might have been stopped otherwise. If that makes any sense. Wait, but uh, you, Vash, you agreed that uh, you thought it was inevitable that Russia would attempt to control Ukraine. Sure. Yes. Mirshammer yeah. thinks it's inevitable if you do a particular thing. R well, right. So what Mirshammer is saying there is, yeah, appeasement. In both cases, like, I think that Russian... Well, hold on. If we're talking about invasion, I don't think that was inevitable. If we're talking about Russia trying to control Ukraine, that was inevitable. That's going to happen no matter what. And if Mirshammer believes that the U.S., like, promising not to let them into NATO would have prevented that, he's wrong. And I would tell no, no, it to no. his face, he... and then I would punch him. Um, Russia was always going to do that. Uh, Ukraine would have been a more or less puppet state. Like, right. Uh, Fuck that. Yeah. yeah. They got to be yeah, free. I, it's, I feel like it's so easy to say fuck that, given that we're seeing the Ukraine really thrive, not thrive, but uh, hold up really well in response to... Uh, if they had been crippled Russian instantly, Russian. if they get nuked, I'll stand by this position. I don't think a peace <laughs> to Putin um, is a good strategy moving forward. I think it's very destructive. If the entire, U if all of Ukraine was glass, you'd still think that uh, we'd made the right call. Absolutely, I do. 100%, yes. Because the sanctions I, um, that would follow that would bleed Russia out harder than what's happening right now. Russia would cease to exist as a country after that. Not even so their allies would be able to Ukraine, support them. You'd sacrifice Ukraine to take out Russia. Well, because in that, in that scenario, that. what I'm describing would have happened anyway. If they were willing to employ that level of aggression against Ukraine, you think they wouldn't against another neighboring country? Like, the, the problem is, the issue here is Russia, yeah, not Ukraine's proximity to Russia, because you know what happens if Russia takes Ukraine? Now they're next to Poland. The, the problem here is Russia, or more, more accurately, Putin, I should say, Putin's government. Um, but, like that, like, that behavior, I think, is inevitable. It's one of the reasons why I think it's dumb to say we should retreat NATO back to the Iron Curtain, because, like, what happens then? Russia takes all those countries up till the Iron Curtain, and then we have 
like the NATO bordering Russia thing again. The problem with Russia has always been Russia. Not that we're not leaving them enough room. They should be given no room, because as long as Russia exists like this, any appeasement is just an invitation to do more behavior like that in the future. Against, uh, or Mearsheimer's argument against uh, expanding NATO is that uh, he's not convinced that the West is willing to commit or to follow through on its NATO commitments in uh, the Balkans specifically. Is I think that, we'd end um, the world over it. You think? Sure. I, uh, in principle... We're not the only country with nukes, after all. Uh, after all, you know, Poland uh, probably wouldn't take particularly well to that. I, um, I, uh, I, I think there would be enough of an outcry, you know, and then armed forces get involved. Yeah, um, yeah, I think we'd be willing to end the world. The question is, is mm -hmm. Russia willing to test us on that? We generally hold to our military treaties, I think. We're, we're pretty aggro about that, so, you know. Given the that, uh, problem is NATO Russia. we got to get rid of Russia. Overwhelmingly democracies... It, uh, the fear is that, uh, the people just won't, uh, they'll struggle to see why they should fight and die for, uh, some small, uh, Balkan country in a way that they're not a... We don't have a draft. As as they are. We send soldiers Shit abroad. Trans. We have soldiers abroad in, like, 60 countries right now. We sent them to Iraq and Afghanistan with a 90% approval rating for George Bush. Okay, well... We can I ask you another question. And we hate Russia too. Like I, I think we'd, I think we'd be kicking for it. It's like, yeah, like half of America wants a no-fly zone over Ukraine right now, even though it would end the world. I think America yeah, would be so begging active. for it. Yeah. Do you think every country should be a uh, NATO member? Yeah, absolutely. Every country but Russia, okay. and then Russia too. I think uh, the issue with that is that the more countries are in NATO, the greater the likelihood that you won't be willing or interested in following through on your NATO commitments. And if you fail to follow through on a single NATO commitment, all of it, not just NATO, but all of your treaties, promises, your word means nothing. Uh, and that means that all the regional hegemons now have uh, free reign. I think um, if we, if NATO were, I mean, if Ukraine were in NATO and we hadn't come to their aid, that's uh, that's it for Taiwan. Um, that's it for um, all of uh, Japan's islands. Um, what other fun regional hegemons are there? But we will come so to their aid. There's a risk. We will end the war there's over. A... We'll end the world over nothing. If all countries are in NATO, no one will fight with anyone else anymore. I, uh, I don't think that's the case. I think sure. that uh, eventually you'll get one of those non-rational uh, actors that uh, you're um, that you pointed out from earlier, who's willing to test the balance. I think democracies uh, engage in imperialism as well. I don't think you'd disagree. Against other countries they have alliances with. It's not like France, Germany, and England are beefing it out, right? I think it's possible Wait, so to build a world, world where the whole world is 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 incapable of fighting with itself. Um, because there are so many interlocking military treaties, so many economic ties, um, that the end of the world would be an inevitable conclusion to, like, any conflict between any countries. And that'd be a good world. We already live in a world with nukes anyway, right? I mean... Wait, I, uh, I don't think it's the case. I think in a world where every country was in NATO, there would still be incentives for countries to fight. Especially like smaller countries would very easily be able to get away with conflict. Well, keep in mind, I I'm being a bit hyperbolic with the all countries should be in NATO. I don't necessarily disagree with that sentiment, but obviously, it, with the world as it is right now, not all countries could be in NATO. I don't want, like, South Sudan in NATO, you know? I like, obviously, some, some house cleaning would have to be done in terms of political viability, but as a concept, the idea of, like, um, military treaties that stretch the world around, yeah. Like, Western Europe isn't fighting with itself anymore, not since World War II. It's just not happening. I don't think there's any it's set of situations. They're having more or less aligned interests rather than a military treaty preventing them from doing so. Why do they have aligned interests? Because the Western democracies just tend to do so. Well, well why? Like, magically? What, what about Western democracies? Uh, in the same way that um, Arab states seem to have... Uh, they're, they're real friendly with each other. Well, well, why? Like Iran and Iraq? Um... No, they're notable examples, uh, or counterexamples, but, um... What makes them different? Then what? Well, then the so other you, Arab uh, states. A global world of democracies just ends conflict? Uh, yes. A global world of democracies where there are strong economic bonds between all these countries? Yes, I think that ends conflict about as well okay, as can. Okay, that adds a, a lot... You are adding more and more things. Uh, and well, the, the every things. country should be part of NATO thing was was obviously like a hyperbolic. Okay. Just yeah. making sure. But yes, you I, said it uh, during the original Mearsheimer video, and I thought it uh, was an interesting sentiment. I think that the entire world, to the best of our ability, 
should be made democratic and made economically interdependent, and then we should open our borders up as much as we can, and all the fine people of those countries should mingle and learn languages from neighboring countries in their but middle school this, education. This, is not, this has nothing to do with the military alliance. Well, uh, military alliance be part of that. But as it stands right now, countries that are actually interested in joining NATO aren't going to be declaring war on each other either. If we're talking about the world as it is right now, then, you know, my real argument is just NATO is a fine enough organization and I'm okay with countries joining it and I'm okay with its proliferation. In the long run, you know, I'm sure that all these countries would have shared military alliances too, right? I mean, that seems likely. If there's a global military, on, uh, why does it seem likely to you? Now I don't disagree or agree. I'm just curious. Well, because if they're already so economically, socially, culturally interdependent that, you know, people freely travel across borders for work, they, um, you know, they, they, they... What would be the incentive to have military alliances in this uh, extraordinarily wonderful world? Well, for the same reason, I suppose, that we do with all of our allies. Like, it's not as though, you know, we... Um, but like, we have military alliances outside of NATO as well with other countries that we're allied with. Um, usually, I think these are just part and parcel of having good geopolitical relations with another country, right? I don't think they're like an exceptional or rare thing. Uh, you usually make military alliances with countries uh, in response to a particular concern that you have. And it seems like in, in your world where everybody's economically interdependent, uh, there wouldn't be such a concern? Sure, yeah. I, I think this I think this semantically follows from the idea that all countries should be a part of NATO in the sense that I'm broadly arguing for economic and military like you know co-determination in countries all around the world the specific organization of NATO the North Atlantic Treaty Organization it, like I don't I don't think that like South Africa should be a part of it, if for no other reason than because that would be confusing linguistically, but, you know, sort of nominative anti-determinism there. But um, the, the okay, broader so sentiment that I'm affecting here, I stand by. Absent the uh, economic interdependency in the current world, uh, you wouldn't want a global military alliance, right? Well, we, we couldn't get one. It'd, it'd be impossible, right? I mean, we're not allies with everyone. You see the risks with having um, military, defensive military alliances that get too large? Not if they get too large, only if they're established hastily. I think that it's possible to establish them in such a fashion that you aren't committing yourself to bad geopolitical disputes, you know? I like, there's a reason, there's a reason why what's happening in Ukraine right now is exceptional and is meaningfully different from what we did in Iraq and Afghanistan, right? It's the reason why I fear Russia so much, or at least I fear their potential to fuck the world up. When America wants to get its imperialist claws running about, what do we do? We invade, with respect to the fine people of Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, um, underdeveloped, like, you know, fucking war-ruined countries. Um, Ukraine was not that. Ukraine was like a relatively developed geopolitically proximate country a country with a modern military force at least after some time their military force back in 2014 was not um not up to par um this behavior this behavior from russia indicates a willingness to engage in imperialism broadly as a rule against countries they don't like but America is not going to be invading any countries like Ukraine anytime soon. I'll eat my hat if this turns out to be the case, but I think for the most part, America does its imperialism through trade. Like, we're never going to look at a country with a level of development comparable to Ukraine and go like, yeah, we're going to invade and occupy them offensively. That would be... It's not impossible. It's just like... Like, why? We do all of our, we do all of our work right now through, like, trade, like neo-imperialism, you know? I think uh, the costs that the United States would incur, uh, not just from the, the cost of the war, but uh, the backlash from the international community are sufficiently high that there is almost no chance that uh, we outright invade and conquer a country, country in the way that uh, Russia's trying to. Yeah, so I guess that would be the hope, right? Eventually, like, the world would be like that. I guess. Like, it's probably like a... It's like a staging thing, you know what I mean? So, step one with imperialism is like what Russia's doing. Russia will literally just, like, invade and annex land. Like a psychopath, you know? And then step two, I guess, is what America's doing, where we will absolutely invade countries, but it's like, oh, we're just rescuing them from Saddam Hussein, and, you know, most of our imperialism is done through trade anyway. And then I think the third level, the one I'd like for us to be at, is where every country is at a level of mutual dependence and, you know, economic development, that war is just always the stupidest way of solving a problem, you know? 
That's the ideal, yeah. Yeah. And that only works if everyone involved is rational, but the more democratic a country is and the more culturally intertwined neighboring countries are, the less likely um, a, a democracy is to to just suddenly jump up the, like, invasion priority tree and fucking attack a neighboring country, you know? Like, that would be the hope. Um... Yeah, but I guess, like, it could happen. Like, maybe one day Germany goes, you know, fucking Fourth Reich and just invades France or something. And if that happens, maybe it will be the end of the world. But, I mean, all the pieces are in place for that to happen already, I guess, you know? Wait, can I uh, pose you one more hypothetical to try to get you uh, on board with Mearsheimer? And then I'll, uh, I guess, drop the subject. Uh, yeah, hit me. All right, let's imagine we're the United States, just the good old U.S. of A. standard. There's uh, a country across the water... And uh, it's uh, majority VGGers. Those are your guys, right? Uh huh. Yes. There's a small ethnic minority. They're the DGGers. Uh huh. If uh, we told the DGGers that we would be helping them in the future, and we were aware that uh, the VGGers really wanted to ethnically cleanse the country, um, do you think that uh, making the VGGers aware that there's a, a time a timetable, a time limit now, on their ability to reach uh, ethnic homogeneity. Do you think that uh, might increase the odds that uh, they act violently now? Are they within the same country, or are they um, are they like two separate countries? And and we, we pledged it, um, like aid to the smaller country of DGGers. I uh, I I don't think it makes a a particularly enormous difference. I think it does. There's a huge difference okay. between saying we will militarily aid this ethnic minority in another sovereign country and we will defend the sovereignty of an existing country that just happens to be like an ethnic minority in the region. I think there's a huge difference between those two legally and like, I guess, I don't know, like optically, but like in a geopolitical sense. In terms of the sense. outcome of um, events. Um, in terms of like how it would play out? Putting your VGDers on a on alert that uh, there's a, a time limit to how, when they want mm, to their goals, that that might uh, incentivize them to act where they otherwise might have, you know, been complacent? Um, well, I guess I, I have to imagine these are separate countries because I can't, I don't really know sure. if I know how it would play out if we're talking about an ethnic minority. It's not like we ever, like, pledged to give military aid to, like, the Kurds or whatever. Um, but uh, let me think. So if it was another smaller country and we said like, hey, some town don't like you join. Yeah, it, it could it could lead to a, it could lead to an increased likelihood of violence in the near future, for sure. Yeah. Okay. With uh I'm I am i am content with that. I think uh I'll I'll definitely join you in uh condemning and being confused by Mearsheimer's language. Um I uh, I'm personally not a realist. Uh I think some of the criticisms you made were at during your video were a little uncharitable. I'm glad we found at least this in the example of uh VGGers getting ethnically cleansed. I'm glad we found this common ground here. Oh wait, is it are the VGGers the ethnic minority or the DGGers the ethnic minority? No, you're you're the big guy, Vosh. Oh, okay, gotcha. The DGGers the ethnic minority. Well, leaving aside the the moral righteousness of the ethnic cleansing of DGGers. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I I do think it's possible that stuff like that can exacerbate violence, but I also think it's possible that if the DGGers want the potential future military support, that it could be morally upstanding to provide that promise to them in the future for a number of reasons. Um, you know, there are a lot of considerations that go into stuff like this. It can get really complicated, difficult to make predictions, but one yeah, of the things... Huh? Almost impossible. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to know what would or would not have happened. I, will I, I just want to take the integrity of the logic. Right, well, yeah, I think the logic is sound. I just don't think that it necessarily follows then that that behavior is always good because that it is appeasement. What we are talking about is appeasement, but it's it's a matter of like relative degrees of engagement. Of course, America engages in appeasement constantly. We deal with countries that are really awful and we don't directly criticize them for it because we don't want to deal with the consequences of their economic, you know, like cutoffs. Saudi Arabia being a pretty clear example. Israel, though we support Israel for many, many, many reasons. Um, but, uh, you know, with, with, well, with all that in line, I guess. Um, yeah, I just think... Um, I guess I just... I worry that the normalization of that logic and its application ubiquitously would mean a, an effective mantle of silence on all struggling people around the world because it will almost always be 
sort of exacerbatory for a country like America to express sympathy with or support for another group, it's also possible the opposite effect can happen. Like, for example, how do we know the reason Israel hasn't just legit genocided the Palestinians full-throated yet isn't because Americans are not, like, fully settled on whether or not it should be okay for Israel to do that. Like, maybe public support from abroad can threaten countries like Israel with potential economic or optical harm in the future that disincentivizes them from doing that. That's a goal with Ukraine, right? Like, one of the points of supporting Ukraine in any respect is like, you know, hey, Russia, like, you will, you will hurt yourself doing this. And they are, you know. Maybe they didn't heed the warning, but they are. Um, and I think that's good, at least. But you cut for me for a second. They are what? They are suffering severe consequences uh, for what they're doing in Ukraine. You know, the world supports Ukraine. And I think that's a good thing. You know, I'm glad. I'm glad that's the direction this has taken, at least. I uh, I would agree with that. I uh, I do think Russia's at fault, despite uh, my being a victim blamer. Apparently, it's, it's all right. I'm not. I, <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I appreciate you coming on. I do. Yeah. Is that uh, is that the end, or can I? Uh, I'm trying to procrastinate. Can I keep shooting the shit with you? Um. No, I have a headache. I'm afraid that is the end. I'm going to have to bring the hammer down, my friend. Um, okay. And, and exhibit the authoritarian time, uh, behavior I dislike so much. Next time, I'd like to ask you about this uh, dirtbag left stuff and your uh, provocateurism. Oh, yeah, I think... No, no, I'm... no. I, uh, it's from a cultural... It's, it's not a... I like your actions. I just have a question about the... Yeah. No, no, you know if what? The hit, hit, me, hit me with a question. Go for it. I'll answer. Okay. I, um... Maybe not a, I don't know if it's a question. I, um, or actually, yeah. Do you think, um, do you think you're underappreciated for what you do? Um, yeah. I imagine a lot of people feel that way, though. I'm probably not for alone context, in that respect. I, um, I was probably, I think I consider myself fairly center left at the moment, but I was, uh, uh, fairly odd right, maybe early in high school. Um, God, years ago. Um, and I don't know that, uh, that switch would have ever been possible if there were not figures on the left who were at least somewhat culturally similar to uh, alt-writers. Not to insult you, but you engage in fun, provocative humor from time to time. Obviously, much less provocative and much less incendiary than on the right. But there's that uh, landing pad between, you know, you can criticize or you can say anything about any race on the right to... Uh, you know, there are some things you shouldn't say, but you can still have fun to, I guess, people further left of you. You can't have any fun. And I, uh, I think that that middle ground is important for the, if there's hope for there to be a pipeline uh, to get people away from alternative right. Yeah, I guess, I guess I just feel like the, the thing is, the, the problem is almost the framing that you've given shows how bad things are right now. Being edgy, being considered an alt-right thing is kind of telling since alt-right oh, shit is like right no, I'm, the culture war on edginess they own it yeah it's just wild right like if you the majority of people in real life are like problematic no, no. sometimes they're edgy sometimes they're reactionary from time to time you know like the ability to engage with this is a political necessity if anyone wants to be like relevant in any kind of broader stage um like, it's not like left edginess is unheard of. George Carlin was pretty fucking edgy, you know? Um, a lot of the arguments Dave Chappelle has made for, like, black liberation, you know, obviously he's not holistically progressive, but those arguments came across pretty fucking edgy. ContraPoints has made some pretty edgy jokes and has made videos defending them. She literally made a video called The Darkness where she talked about the value of, um, of, of using, like, edgy humor as a way of, like, venting one's feelings or, like, expressing a political interest. Um, though her context wasn't quite the same as mine, I think it speaks broadly to the value of engaging in that kind of language when you can, when it's fun to do so, you know, when it's helpful, when it's not harmful. But yeah, I don't know. I think a lot of people just don't like it when I do it. So, Why do you think that uh, so many prominent figures on the left are this, uh, I don't know how to frame, uh, anti-fun type? The more uh, ones that disagree with your manner of engaging with humor? I think... <sighs> fuck i'm gonna sound like reactionary here but i really do think this i think 99.9 .9 percent of people form their political opinions through really stupid emotional like bias oriented things like conservative left center liberal like all groups like there's just it's just like dumb tribal politics just some stupid you know emotional whatever and i think that for a lot of people on the left it is stuff like 
bitterness, jealousy, and resentment at people who have power. If there's one thing that I legitimately do think the conservatives have a massive ideological leg up on us from, it's that conservatives are not disposed towards, um, towards, um, acting bitterly in response to, um, other people's well-being, at least not nearly as much as leftists seem to. Now, they still do this all the time, don't get me wrong. It's a pretty con- like, envy is a pretty common, like, human thing, but I think conservatives exhibit this less often, and they do so less holistically. Um, and that, like, I think that really fucks the left pretty often, because unfortunately, it turns what should be a legitimate critique of power, which should be critiqued, into an emotional bias against the concept of having power, and if you have bias against people who hold power, then you don't allow people within your movement to become powerful, and you hamstring yourself anytime you get a, uh, you know, like a place to speak. I think that's one of the big issues at the moment. It's not being anti-fun, it's just a lot of people on the left legitimately cannot understand when their innate aversion to, um, you know, people's fortune and power, which is so often a product of abuse and exploitation, is actually politically beneficial. Uh-oh. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Hello? Yeah, yeah. Is it cutting again? Uh, briefly. Uh, did you hear everything that I said? Yeah, I think it sounded like you came to a, a natural close there. I did, yes. Yeah, I, I said, uh... It, uh, it, uh... Hmm. I don't know if I'm, uh... I'd have to think about it. I don't know that I want to on video say that I agree that the uh, left is disposed towards uh, these particular negative characteristics. But yeah. um, it seems reasonable uh, on paper. I just want to clarify that I don't think the left is uniquely bad in this. There are horrible cognitive biases and emotional like problems that go into how conservatives often form their political opinions. Like disgust, for example, is the root of a ton of homophobia and transphobia and shit like that. Fear is the root of a lot of racism and xenophobia. Um, I only say that the left is unique in that some of the emotional precursors that go into their arguments are uniquely bad when it comes to coalition building and power building. Fear and resentment and disgust, or sorry, fear and disgust aren't as bad at preventing people from achieving power as things like resentment to the people who are more successful than you. That is way more politically harmful. Anyway, anyway, my head hurts. I, I have to run and take a second to chill. I do appreciate you coming on. Of course. Can I plug myself before I go? Please, yeah, go for it. Yeah, I have a tiny... Uh, I actually have to put all the videos back up. I had to take them down uh, working with the campaign. But um, oh. I have a tiny YouTube channel for now called Seabass uh, Politics. If you want to check it out, check it out. And uh, I hope I get the chance to disagree with you on something again, Vosh. But uh, you tend to be pretty agreeable. I leapt on the chance to... Uh, do this. Well, I was happy to uh, see the email from you. Sea bass is spelled the way sea bass is spelled, I assume. Yeah, like gotcha. the fish. Thank you, and have a good All night. All right, well, you too, sir. I actually really enjoyed that convo. I know we actually, I know we had a lot of disagreements and stuff, but I did enjoy that convo. Okay, hold on, pigeon. <laughs>